from the Northeastern uh, Physics and the Mathematics Departments. And uh, he's, uh, he's also been very active in the machine learning for uh, math and physics. So uh, he'll tell us about uh, problems in math theory. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. And thanks to all of you for coming and for the interest. So I will be taking concepts that have been introduced this morning and I will sort of exemplify the ideas using uh, not theory. I have um, four different parts and I hope that these four parts uh, sort of will show up in one way or another when you think about mathematics and conjectures and machine learning. And um, I will go through them and <coughs> illustrate using not here as an example, what you can do there. So the first one is about data representation, and we had just Mike make this comment that sometimes your data is not just a number, sometimes your data might be relations or even type of graph. In the Google example, they just had a bunch of geometric invariants, a bunch of algebraic invariants. These were already numbers, and they were just sort of trying to find relations between these numbers. However, you might be interested of sort of giving the knot itself to the machine learning algorithm, and then you need to think about how you represent this knot. The second part will be about opening the black box, so this white boxing that Jim talked about, and there are different techniques, and I will introduce them, and again, exemplify how to do it. The third one, we already had the question of, um, for example, using generative models or so to find examples or count examples to conjectures. So once you have arrived at a conjecture, let's say using step one and two, you might want to produce more examples that either substantiate it, or you might want to produce count examples to put it to the test. And finally, I will give examples of how you can use machine learning to actually arrive at provable results. And Jim, of course, already mentioned how to do this with reinforcement learning. Good. So representations of knots. So a knot is just embedding of a circle into the three sphere, and I can embed, I can represent this in many different objects, in many different forms. So if I want to feed this object to my machine learning algorithm, I need to somehow turn it into some data. And there are many different ways of doing it. For example, I could write it as a closure of the braid. I could associate a ghost code with it, which is a bunch of integers. I could turn it into a planar diagram, so take a projection, label the crossing strands, and I get these bunch of integers. I could use what's called a DT code, get these integers. I could turn it into a grid diagram, which looks something like this. So it could be a matrix of zeros and ones. Um, so there are a bunch of different ways of doing it. I'm not explaining how to construct these because that's not important for the talk. What's important to see is that, for example, this is a very efficient type of encoding in terms of the numbers you need. So here I have many more numbers to encode than not than here. But of course it's not clear that this is the best way of encoding it for the machine learning algorithm in the end. Good. So once you so once you have all these representations, what's sort of the guiding principle? How would you choose one over the other? And of course in principle it doesn't matter. There are algorithms that allow you to turn any one of these representations into any other representation. So there are two aspects to this question. One is sort of coming from the computer science side, and one is coming from the mathematics side. So the question from the computer science side would be, which of these encodings is the most efficient? And how can the, what does the ML algorithm make use of this efficiency in encoding? And second of all, can I choose an encoding such that I can use some of the theories that have been developed by computer scientists in the past, like turning a turning problem in, in number theory into a game, for example, such that I, I can just sort of build on develop, latest developments in the computer science community and use the tools that they have known, developed, and uh, improved over the last decade. So in math, you might um, Coming from the math side, you might ask, sort of, is there a representation that has some beneficial property which others do not? So for the problem I want to tackle, is there one that's preferred from a mathematical point of view? And I will give examples for these, for these three things now using not theory. So the first is about the efficiency of encoding. 
Um, you're not supposed to read this. The point is just sort of, <laughs> this is the knot. You can represent it with a bunch of points in 3D. So these are just these points where you turn, and then you just connect them one to another, and you get some knot. You can turn this into a PD diagram by just projecting it down to this plane. You get something like this, and you have much more <coughs> numbers. Or you can use Vogel's algorithm to turn it into a braid, and then you get this. So you see sort of the, number, the numbers you need to describe one and the same object are quite different here. So now what you can do is you just take these numbers, you feed it to your machine learning algorithm. In this case, it was a simple neural network. And we were trying to predict the hyperbolic knot volume, which is sort of the volume that the complement of the knot uh, has, if it was a hyperbolic knot. And as you can see here, so I did this for the braid words, w, BW is the braid word, I did it for the PD code, and I did it for the points. And not only does the prediction, sort of the accuracy that you can reach, depend crucially on the embedding, it's also the case that sort of the longest one here, which you would have thought might be the most inefficient one, actually gives you the best result. Furthermore, if you were just sort of in this exploratory phase where you're just trying to see whether one thing does predict another, if you had to start with this representation here, you would be able to predict the, uh, with this simple neural network, you would be able to predict the hyperbolic knot volume up to 70% accuracy. So you would almost be of a factor of two on average. So you might conclude, if you knew nothing about it, you might conclude that actually the hyperbolic knot volume is not encoded in these points, which is a wrong conclusion. Of course, this uniquely identifies the knot, so the uh, hyperbolic knot volume is uniquely identified. If you looked at the representation of the PD code, you actually get an accuracy of 15% or so. So in this case, you would say, clearly say there is a relation between the knot and the hyperbolic knot volume. Yes, Mike? Did you try a, a, a 3D picture with more points that gives a smoother curve, perhaps? There's a, so that, one, that might be one conjecture. Just yeah, exactly. So of course, you could. That's a very good question. The question was, um, maybe you could make this somehow smoother. Yeah, so we're looking at thick, curve, at thick knots, where sort of the angle is not as big, or sort of smoothening it out, giving it more points. But sort of our question was, there's this observation that if essentially if you take a 3D thing and you project it down to two dimensions, it produces extra crossings. So this, is, uh, this has been discussed in this paper. And sort of they said, if you, for example, want to know the linking number of a knot, you need to look at all the crossings, essentially, to know where that's linked. Here, um, you can do it much more simple because then um, you have less, less crossings, less data to look at. So this is actually faster. So you can devise an algorithm, a provable algorithm, which was proven in this paper, that works faster in the, with the three-dimensional representations than it does with the two-dimensional representations. This is the fourth input for your original problem. Did you try? I haven't tried yet, no. You didn't data augment the PD code on the permutation. I did not dead augment anything here, yeah. Just, just throwing it at the machine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so efficiency encoding and the encoding itself can matter for your conjecture generation, whether or not you come up with, uh, with conjecturing that these things actually are related versus they are not related. The second example is transformation to other problems. So these different representations I were showing you do encode the topological information in different ways. So example, for if you have a braid word, if you give me the braid word sigma 1, sigma 1, sigma 1, I kind of can see in my head what this knot will look like. Whereas if you give me the DT code 2 minus 4, 6, I have no idea what it is. Um, so braid words, if you use a braid word embedding, so that you already have the name word in there, so you might actually think, well, this might lend itself to applications from a natural language processing. Indeed, if you have a non-obedient group, you have a word problem. We are trying to see whether two, uh, whether two sequences of generators are actually the same element. So if you can translate it into some language, natural language processing tool, there's, of course, one of the biggest um, advances in machine learning have been done in these, this area over the last week, uh, sorry, over the last years. These grid diagrams look like something that might be actually very good to tackle with uh, computer visions or graph networks. As an example, I want to talk about a paper that we published two years ago with uh, Sergei Gukov, Jim in the audience, and Piotr Sikorsky. 
Um, and what we did there is we just sort of took, took a knot, translated it into a braid word, and then asked sort of the word problem, is this braid word, the closure of this braid word, equivalent to the empty braid word, which means is the knot the unknot. And we tried different representations for that, and we found that in this case, the braid words actually work better than the Gauss codes or the DT codes. And we tried sort of machine learning techniques that were developed for natural language <coughs> processing to tackle this word problem. The third example is the same problem of recognizing the unknot. And there was some work done by Kaufman and others that also asked this question. And they were coming at it from a little bit of a different angle. So this is an example where knowing mathematical properties of the representation actually helps you. So it has been known that there are somehow hard R knots. So these are knots that you have to make more complicated before you can simplify them. Um, so the question is if I have these hard R knots and here are the papers where people actually have an algorithm to generate these. So it's not even clear that this is representation invariant. So the fact that you have to make it more complicated to make it simpler might be true in a braid word, but it might not be true in a DT code. And in general, this is not known, at least I, I don't think it is known, whether this, um, whether this hardness property is preserved on the maps. But what is known, and what's proven, proven by Dunikov, is that this property of hardness is absent if you use the grid diagrams. So this is a mathematical statement that you can use to sort of take away this problem of having to make something more complicated to make it simpler. So this is why Kaufman et al. built their I'm not machine learning problem using uh, Dunikov moves. So the question you need to ask is then, can my algorithm actually deal with the fact that there are these hard unknowns, that I have to make things more complicated to make it simpler? In our case, we use reinforcement learning and as we know from playing chess, for example, reinforcement learning is happy to make a pawn sacrifice. It's happy to take a hit if it in the long run can achieve some, the, the ultimate goal. So this is how we accounted for the fact that there are these hard or not using a machine learning technique. Kaufman et al. accounted for using mathematical insight. So these are the three examples I wanted to give about in data representation. Feel free to interrupt me because I would be going on with uh, interpretability of uh, machine learning techniques. Yes, please. Have there been approaches to develop shortcuts between properties, between representation? Like this property, this representation has this property, and this kind of can correspond loosely, perhaps, to the property of another representation. So you can stick with one and approximate something that you would want to investigate in another. That's, that's a very good question. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the answer. And I think it will very much depend on your property. But for example, you could, what you could do is you could say, OK, short of knowing which, which encoding of the data has which property and which one doesn't, I could just give several encodings of the same knot to the machine learning algorithm. And maybe it can make use of it can choose the one that works best. And something that has been done in very recently is to actually have what's called expert networks. So if you have a neural network and then you have some experts that decide which part of the network to activate. So if it sort of if you just give it all the representations that you possibly know of and, and the machine algorithm can actually learn which which one is beneficial, it could sort of pull I mean take the switch and say, okay, so for this this part of the representation I use for this and this part I use for that. Mike. Yeah. Sort of an open-ended question, but uh, so the, if you look at, for example, the invariance used in the uh, GMIME paper or the, the type of thing that uh, Drew was talking about, every object, there's an infinite number of objects and every one is described by, you know, 66 numbers, these, these 10 numbers. Now, the representations you described for the knot do capture all the data about the knot, but then in this infinite set of knots, the number of, the size of the input grows. So any, any given finite network can only learn a finite subset, you know, a, 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 can only work with a finite subset of the knots. So that seems like a, an essential difference. Do you have any comment about that? Yeah. Um, so what Kaufman et al. did to, to 
to account for this. So there is, um, there are ways in which you can just sort of feed an infinite sequence to a neural network. So you, you just sort of give it. Well, give like it a, a recurrent network can take an infinite time exactly. sequence. So, so yeah. that, okay, so that, that would be one type of the answer. Yeah, exactly. So they used a recurrent neural network, which just sort of read the braid world until it was over. It built some average out of it and then uh, went on to to to, uh, to go in front. And these language models, of course, when you have, also when you have a sentence, you don't know how long the sentence is a priori. Well, they typically have a window. They're, they're, they're yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So you can try to build something into the architecture by sort of just reading and averaging. But, but you don't feel that's essential. I mean, you know, as, as you say, you, you, yeah. you could then restrict the attention to algorithms yeah. that could handle an arbitrary yeah. size knot. But, yes. but will you do that? Or? <coughs> so what we did is we just sort of we had got the best results from training it for different size neural nets. So we had a neural network that could take up to four knots with 40 crossings, a second one that could take up to 60, a third one that could take up to 80, and you would just take the smallest one that worked. Okay. So that's, uh, that's what gave us the best results. Okay. Yeah. okay, so the second thing is about feature scoring. Let's say you now have a neural network and you need to, or you want to understand how does it actually arrive at its conclusion. So let's say it, relates to invariants and you want to know, or relates a bunch of invariants to a bunch of other invariants and you want to know which ones are the crucial ones. And I want to cover three techniques. One is the gradient saliency that uh, Jim mentioned. Um, the other two are called uh, layer based importance propagation and, uh, and uh, feature permutation. Before I go there, I, I just very briefly, wanted to, I need to sort of make sure that everybody knows what a neural network is, but Jim covered this, so I won't, I won't say anything more about it. One thing I want to point out is that there's a theorem which says that if you parameterize functions in this way as a neural network, that's for some reason that's unreasonably efficient of uh, sort of expanding a function on some basis. And it has been proven that if you do this, your function is a universal approximator. So it can learn any function you like. In particular, it can learn the function you're interested in, and it can learn arbitrarily many functions you're not interested in. So the question then is, how do you sort of make sure that it learns the function you actually want to learn, and how do we extract the things that are important for this function? Good. So the first one is a feature scoring, and this is an algorithm that works for any machine learning algorithm, not just for neural networks. The second and third thing I will be talking about are specific to neural networks. So the idea is just, let's say, I, I mean, I'll illustrate with a neural network, but as I said, you could use a decision tree, you could use a SVN, you could use whatever you like here. So typically, when you have um, these supervised learning tasks, what you do is you feed a bunch of inputs here, and you just get an output. So this, this function method maps a vector of R2 into R. So I have a bunch of uh, R2 vectors here, Z11, Z12, Z21, Z22, Z31, Z32, and so on. And now I want to know sort of which ones are the important ones to get an answer here. So what you can do is you can, what's called a feature corruption. So I keep all, all of them the same, but I, let's say I permute randomly the first feature here, the first input to the neural network. So instead of pairing Z11 with Z12, I pair C31 with Z12, and the rest I keep same here, put C71 here, I put C11, and so on, and just, just randomly permute it. Um, so by randomly permuting it, you ensure that you're not changing the overall distribution from which these first numbers are drawn, but sort of you're obscuring, you're obscuring them. So if the neural network actually needed this number, to make its prediction. After you obscure it, the neural network um, or the machine learning algorithm should not be able to perform very well. So what you can do is you can just check how well did it do initially versus after I corrupted this feature. And if it goes down the accuracy by a lot, this means this feature actually was pretty important. And if it doesn't go down, then of course it wasn't really using this feature at all. So that's a very simple technique of actually assigning importance to the input. And of course, you just repeat this for the second feature and the third feature and so on. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's uh, feature scoring using feature permutation. 
The second one is called layerized irrelevance propagation. It was introduced uh, fairly recently, and it was also used by colleagues uh, in South Africa to actually find an important feature importance in in a knot theory. So what this does is it sort of goes about it backward. You have some answer, and you assign it a relevance score of one, and now. So remember that sort of going going from here to here, you multiply by a matrix and add a bias. So you're just sort of checking how big is the matrix entry here versus there. And if it's larger, let's say it's uh, eight times, let's say it's four times larger. So then you would assign a Bellman score of 0 0.8 to this one and 0 0.2 to this one. So this would mean because so mostly the answer mostly comes from this from this node here. And then you go to the next layer and you see sort of which how did this node come about? Well, it came about from these three, and it mainly sort of contained information from that node. So you assign a relevance score such that the sum is still one, and you just distribute it according to the weights, and you go backward and backward and backward until you reach the beginning, and you can say, okay, so this one had a relevance score of 0 0.9, and this one of 0 0.1. So this feature was much more important in, so of course, the most important one in, in arriving at your final conclusion. The third one is a very similar idea, and this is a, what's called gradient saliency, and this is what, a, what Google used, what DeepMind used, and also we will see a demonstration of this later in the afternoon. So what this does is just says, okay, your neural network is a function, so you can take a derivative of the neural network. I want to see how the output changes with the input, so I'm calculating the gradient of the output with respect to the input functions input values. And of course the larger the gradient is, the more the more the output will change if I if I change the input. So I'm using a relevance score that's just proportional to the gradient of the function that is represented by your neural network. Of course doing this requires to be able to take the derivative of your machine learning algorithm. That's why I said sort of you can take a derivative of the decision tree or so. But if you have a neural network, this is also a nice way of assigning feature importance to the different inputs and seeing then which ones mainly contribute to getting getting a final result. Good. So this covers uh, the second part, uh, how to uh, white box a black box model, how to actually infer which inputs are important to come up with the answer. Again, I'll break here, see whether there are any questions, because after that I will move on to the third part, which is generating examples and counterexamples. Historical question. This gradient saliency, this equation, is extremely natural. Is there any reason why people only came up with it in 2017? Um, so I'm not sure this is actually the first reference. <laughs> That's the one that I saw. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it's the one that they saw. <laughs> Like, um, suppose we can trust DeepMind that they cited the first instance. Probably, yeah. Um, it is very natural. I mean, if you're a mathematician, actually, you don't want to do this because you can actually can't. I mean, neural network in general is not smooth. Uh, you have, I mean, the, the, most, the most standard neural networks just have relos, which have kings. And yeah. so you can't take actual derivatives, but you, know, you don't hit them, so you don't care. Uh, a second reason might be that there have been sort of this statistical attribution techniques. Like like this one, these have been around for for longer. That's right. Um, so people might have to sort of, sort of focus on this. And, and, and your point is, this is general because it doesn't require differentiability. Where exactly. And, and, and the relatives really are a problem. And this one, this one, this one yeah. doesn't work. So the weather. It's just the fact that it's not uh, seeing it's seeing one particular place, you know, in, in the input output relation, and that's you know if you move it a little bit, and the relative changes. I see. Okay, then I'll move on to the third part of the talk, and this is about yeah, constructing counterexamples. So to see what the problem is, let us sort of look at this example. So this is an example, famous example from NVIDIA, where they use a generative model to generate pictures of faces of people that don't exist. So these look like, like a passport photos or like a photo of somebody, 
but they were completely generated out of white noise. So to human, of course, they, I, I couldn't tell that whether this was an actual human being or just, just a generated picture. But the point is, of course, if, I, if you wanted to actually do this to generate images of faces of people, and you would just randomly draw pixels, you would, most of the time you would get something like, that looks like this, and very rarely you would get something that looks like that. So the space of images inside this space of all possible pixels that actually look like human beings is a very tiny subset, or it's a very high co-dimensional surface inside um, this full space that will produce pixels like this. And with knots, you have a similar problem. Of course, you could just randomly generate knots and just hope and pray that they have the property that you want in order to construct a potential example or counterexample, but you might never get this. So if you were doing this randomly, you, you will never get this picture. So the question is, can you somehow condition the generator? Can you do something to generate uh, knots that are drawn from a specific distribution such that they are very likely to have a certain property that you're interested in for your conjecture? And there are several techniques to do this. So one are these, uh, the GANs, the generative adversarial networks that had been briefly mentioned before. There are techniques they call the variation order encoders, there are generative flows, and it's a pretty long list here. And of course, I won't have time to cover all of this. I will just sort of focus on one thing, which are so-called embedding techniques. So just, just sort of one word, one, one word of vocabulary. The last layer before the output layer in the neural network is called the embedding layer. The name comes from the fact that so the neural network gets some data representation at input, and it learns a useful embedding of this before it produces the output. So it's sort of it's just taking the R to the in, R to the D in, and mapping it to, into some R to the N. And most of the thing that the neural network does is actually it learns a suitable representation for the data such that it can come up with a good out, good answer. So this is why this is called the embedding layer. If you have a variational order encoder, so what this does is you actually train in your network, you give it some input, and you try to learn the identity function, the output should be the input, but so that you have this bottleneck layer in here, which is called the latent space or bottleneck layer, <coughs> where you make it smaller, such that sort of the idea is you're encoding the information that's in here in some smaller R to the D dimensional space. And again, we will see an example of this later today, how, and how you can use this uh, for, generate, for generation. So let's just uh, one more work. Sorry. Just real quick. So, so even though you're pointing out here that it is speculative because you haven't actually done it in this context yet, I mean, it, it's worth pointing out that in machine learning, people do conditional generative models regularly so that this sort of idea is something that people already do even if you haven't done it in this context. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. It's believable that this will work. It is believable that it will work, but it's speculative in the sense that I don't have anything to show you yet. It's all work in progress. Good. So what people have seen, indeed, in this, this embedding layer techniques is that the neural network likes to learn an embedding that is actually semantic for words, for example. So what they did is they sort of fed it the word king, somehow mapped it to R to the D in, and then they looked at where does this word king end up in this embedding layer? Where does it end up here? And they did the same for the word queen, and they did it for man and woman. And what they saw is without actually teaching this to the neural network, that the neural network learned an embedding such that king minus queen plus, uh, or king minus queen equals man minus woman. Or you, you could say sort of you take king, you subtract man, you add woman, you get a queen. So the neural network learns these things without actually being taught nowhere in the loss of the neural network does it, does, do you force it to do this? Or it also learns, like, if, for example, walking to, is to walk like swimming is to swim. So it learns gram grammar. It learns that China and Beijing is like Vietnam and Hanoi is like Germany and Berlin. Um, so there are the questions. Good. So that's some semantic that you can give to words. So how does it show up in not theory? And of course, you have relations like king minus man plus woman equals queen. You have skin relations, for example, in, in, in not theory that look similar to this. So the question is sort of, will you learn something like the skin relations if you're asking it about calculating Jones polynomials? So, Good. so 
this is an illustration of, again, sort of not using knots, but using handwritten digits because they are very easy to demonstrate. And this is asking again, sort of, how does it, where are these things embedded? And you see sort of the nines are embedded up here. And then if you go further in the embedding space, further to the right, you see that it turns into four and into six and into zero. And if you go down, you see the zero turns into six, turns into one. So yeah, sort of these different handwritten digits live in different, in different areas of this embedding space, just in the same way as king and man and woman and queen lived in different points in the embedding space. And again, we will see a demonstration of this using actually handwritten digits, precisely this example in the afternoon. So what you could do now is um, you could generate, so you can use this as a generative model, but sort of starting with something that you have and just walking around in this latent space and then sort of converting a nine into a four, into a six, and into a zero. So you can generate, or if you sort of know that zeros are embedded down here, you could just generate a bunch of zeros by just sort of going down here, or a bunch of ones by just going over there. So you can use this to generate um, new stuff with uh, specific properties. Good. So can you use this for not theory somehow? Um, so one thing you can try is, let's say you want to learn a knot invariant. So what you can do is you can just feed it a knot, and the same knot where you sort of just sort of took, took this thing here and twisted it, or sort of pulled the string down here. So you can generate all of these are actually the, topologically the same knot. They're all the trefoil, you just obscured it a bit. So I have this equivalence class, it's in principle infinite equivalence class of knots for the trefoil, uh, for, the, uh, for the next knot and so on. So I'm just sort of generating tons of knots that are equivalent. And now I'm training a neural network, which is this function f here. If I give it sort of this knot, it should just give back this knot. If I give it this knot, it should give back the first knot. If I give it the third knot, it should give back the first. Give it the fourth knot, it should always just give me this thing. So I'm forcing it to learn an invariant embedding. Just because all these topologically invariant knots are just mapped to the same object. And then I do the same for the set, for the, for the next topologically dip, distinct knot in this equivalence class, and I'm forcing it again to always give the same answer. And if my neural network actually has figured out how to do this, <coughs> it has learned something that only depends on the topology, but not on the actual different representation. That's the idea. So now I have at my embedding layer, I have a representation of this knot which somehow captures the topology of the knot rather than the um, specific properties. So again, if I look at my embedding layers, I have a bunch of, so the trifle goes here, the figure eight knot goes down there, and so on. So now I could do the same thing that I, that I did previously and sort of go from this knot to that knot. I will hit some other knot in between, so going from a, from a nine to a zero produce a six in between. So I will get um, these type of knots. And if I can somehow condition my embedding such that it embeds knots that have a specific property close together, I can use this to generate knots with a certain property. In fact, I can even force it, I can use something that's called a triplet loss to force it to learn such an embedding, where I sort of give it types of examples which I say it, it should have, I mean, which it should embed close to, close to the example it had, and another point where you say it should push it farther away, so that's why it's called a triplet. You have a representative, a new thing, and some, so something that you say it should be similar to the representative and something that you say it should be different from the representative. And then it's sort of maximizing the distance between the anchor and the positive, and minimi so it's minimizing the distance between the anchor and the positive and maximizing the distance between the anchor and the negative. So it's pushing different things apart in the embedding space and pulling sim uh, things that are uh, similar together. So in this way, you can force actually an embedding to have um, certain properties embedded close together. So this is a picture where we did this for 100 and not so <coughs> far. This is a, our embedding layer was six dimensional. Of course, I can't show you some, something six dimensional, so what I'm showing is a two dimensional. Uh, representation, it's a projection of the six dimensional embedding space using something that's called uh, UMAP. So UMAP sort of is a visualization technique 
which the, which does a manifold learning, so it's learning the data manifold and then projecting this manifold into two dimensions. And you see that these knots actually very nicely cluster. So it has learned these invariants. It has learned to map these different knots all to the same knot. And in the embedding layer, this means that sort of they are all mapped into these different spaces. So now you could either use this for generations, sort of going from here to there and see what knot you get in between, or you could open up the black box and see sort of what actually did it learn. So given the knot, how did it, which topological invariant is it using here to do the embedding? We haven't done either of these. Good. So this is about generation, how you could sort of incentivize your generator to learn knots with a specific property. Let's say you want to, examples of hard knots, you want to generate hard knots that are hard R knots, you want to generate slice knots. There are obstructions for being hard, there are obstructions for being slice. There are all kinds of obstructions, and if you just draw a random knot, the thing you get might actually <coughs> not satisfy this construction. So you would have to generate a long, long time randomly until you get something that is actually worthwhile and checking your conjecture with. Maybe, maybe you said this, what, what exactly is the input? I mean, you say braid word, but can you be a little bit more? Yeah, so what I'm doing is I'm taking the braid word that corresponds to the trifoil, that's the 111. Then I'm taking a stabilization of the braid word, that's 1112. Then I'm taking one. And you're encoding the braid word as a. Just as integers. So I'm giving the, these integers 111, 1112, 1121. So I'm giving them all of them, and I say the answer should be 111 always. And then, and then those are inputs of successive units, or those are the integers are, are put into the network now? Yeah, so I'm just, I'm just inputting 111 to the neural network and telling it the answer should be 111. In, in, in successive Yes, in units, successive. As, as integer values. Yes, exactly. So my training set is sort of, it's a supervised learning task. We have a bunch of inputs, which are the these different braid words, and the labels for all of these different braid words is just. And is, there, is this a, a fully connected network? Is there some sort of sequential, is it the <coughs> sequential nature of the inputs encoded somehow? No, in this case, it was, um, it was just a fully connected neural network. And, and you're, you're putting it in as the entire braid word vector, right? Yeah, you, so you, it's not current. Yeah, no, no, you're putting in the entire braid word, then you're, you're putting, putting in the next braid not, word. But you're not telling it the ordering of the, of the successive you know, operations in the braid. No, I'm actually I'm scrambling this up, so I'm just sort of, so I'm giving it the, the vector 111 here, and I'm asking it to produce the output 111. Then I'm giving it the 1212, which is this knot, and I'm asking it to produce yeah, yeah, I'm asking this very technical little question. I mean, so, okay. so I, again, the, the, the meaning of the braid does depend on the order of, of the generators. And, and yeah, but I'm giving it sort of, I'm giving it an all of tuples, so I'm giving it the word 1212, I'm not giving it 1122 or whatever. That would be a different braid. But if it's a fully connected network, yeah. you would have to learn that order. That's right. And how, is it, yeah. do you give it any clues to learn that order? No, we no we did. Sorry, now I understand the question. Yeah. Sorry, it's a good yeah. So if it's fully connected, it there's no it loses the sense of ordering of the generators. That's 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 correct. Right, right. Um, in the Unlock project, we saw that we so in the Unlock in the Unlock project, we had as I said this tool from for natural language processing where the order of words actually does matter a lot. Um, and what we saw there is we had an architecture that kept track of, yeah. of the ordering, was an attention transformer. We also had a, a fully connected neural network that doesn't do this, and the machine learning algorithm learned almost as well as it did with the transformer. So it learned the fact that this ordering actually encodes something. Um, yeah, so the reason why we then didn't use a transformer but used um, use the simpler setup was because so okay. by the intuition we gained from the other project, this also worked well. Okay. okay, so this brings me to my last example. So if, again, if there are questions concerning generation, you can ask them now and after that I will talk about applications of reinforcement learning. Okay, good. So one of the problems we attacked was uh, the unknot decision problem, and this was just a question, is a given order representation of the unknot? So essentially, this one is, and 
you can do a sequence of moves that actually proves it. So if we had a machine learning algorithm, so this is like a game. You're telling it, so if you start here, you pull this in, you pull that out, you twist this thing, you twist it again, and you get the unknot. So we gamified this by setting up an agent that can do these moves, and it will just tell you, so sort of, now you do this, now you do that, now you do that, such that in the end, given a starting knot, we can actually, if you had this thing in front of you, you could actually physically do this and prove that a given knot is the unknot. So this is how we obtain sort of provable results for the unknot using machine learning. And so the credit, this is actually interesting history, what, uh, what is actually the complexity of this problem. I mean, if it was simple to do it, it's probably not worth throwing machine learning at it. I had a person coming to me who wanted to do some, solve some problem which boiled down of solving a linear system of Diophantian equations. This is known to be in P, and I told him don't, don't admit it's machine learning. There's a triple L algorithm, this works incredibly well, it's, it's in P, there's no point in actually doing this with machine learning. But this one is a, is a little bit more interesting. So actually this was shown to be in NP, this problem, deciding whether or not it's the or not. And it later was also shown to be in cohen P, first assuming a generalized Riemann hypothesis by Cooperberg, and then Mark Lackenby, the person who was also featuring prominent in the Google result, proved it without a generalized Riemann hypothesis. The fact that it's in NP and in cohen P makes it very likely that this thing is not NP or cohen P complete. Because people just believe that NP and cohen P are different. If it was complete, it couldn't be different. And mathematicians, I mean, many people agree that probably they are this distinct. And then later, Lackenby actually announced a proof that it was what's called quasi-polynomial, so that means it's still not solvable in polynomial time, but at least it's not growing exponentially, so it's somewhere in between. This is unpublished, but um, you can look at the talk he gave. <coughs> so the amusing thing is now we can do conjecture generation. You take the word unknown and you replace it by prime. So there's a prime decision problem. Given a number, is it, is it a prime? And it turns actually out the story is remarkably similar. So first it was shown in 75 to be in NP, then it was shown to be in co-NP. This makes it unlikely it's, it's co-NP complete. Then there was a proof that it's quasi-polynomial uh, in 83, and then 25 years later or so, something like that, uh, 20 years la later, uh, it was proven that actually the prime decision is a problem in P. You can decide whether a number is prime in polynomial time. So for physicists, this is a proof that the other decision problem is also in P, and you can generate a conjecture that since this took 20 years, we will have a proof of this by 2040. <laughs> so that's my, my contribution to the conjecture generation here. Good. So we did two things with the Arnotts. Uh, first of all, we just gave it to a neural network and we asked it, is it given not the Arnott, yes or no? This was just a this was this decision problem, yes, no question. And we saw that, so we did this for different number of crossings of the knot, and we saw that it got very good at it. So, in fact, up to 98% accuracy. Okay. So this uh, this is of course interesting. So this of course this clearly tells you there's a correlation between the input and the unknot, but that's known. I mean, Braidwood characterizes the knot, and given the knot, it's clear whether or not it's the unknot, even though it might be hard to tell in practice. The problem is there are these hard or nots, and nothing in this particular setup sort of keeps you from, from having problems with them. And indeed, our machine learning algorithms here had problems with the hard or nots. And for a mathematician, of course, 90, having 98% accuracy still means that you can be wrong about 2% and you can be very wrong about them. So this is not so this, is, this is not allowing you to prove anything. You can shortlist them, you could say this is very likely to be this is very likely to be uh, the unknot, and then you can look at it more closely if it's a relevant or an interesting unknot. So for, there was an example where this was done for slice knot. There was a famous um, knot, the Conway knot, which was not known to be slice. People trained a neural network, asked the neural network, is the Conway knot slice? And the answer was 50%, yes, 50%, no. Okay. So this, this is contrasted with the reinforcement learning. We have different algorithms here. So the green one is just sort of what what would happen if you tried randomly doing some moves. So you take out your, your headphones from the back and you try to untangle them, you do something randomly, and eventually you succeed. This is what you can see here. And then we have the machine learning algorithms, 
we succeeded sort of for 100 crossing nodes 80% of the time. And as I said, this is provable. So it gave you a sequence of moves you have to do in order to obtain the R naught. A second interesting thing that we observed with respect to just sort of the neural network that gives you a yes no answer without any proofs is uh, we looked at the prediction. So the way we set it up is it says one if it is at the R naught, and it says zero if it's not the R naught. And so we looked at sort of the answer it gave. So it can give you 0 0.5, so this would be a point somewhere here. Or can you give you an answer which is 2 to the minus 15, so essentially 0. These are the numbers down there. And for whatever reason, it learned this from something that looks somewhat like a line in this log plot. And when I'm plotting on the x-axis, is the maximal absolute value of the Jones polynomial of the knot. So for some reason, the higher this, uh, the, the coefficient, of, oh, sorry, the, the exponent in the Jones polynomial is, the more sure it was that it actually is, the, is, is a non-trivial knot. And this is correct because the Jones polynomial not being zero precisely tells you that it is, cannot be the, uh, that it cannot be the R knot. We never trained it on this. This is something it just did by itself. We haven't tried to follow this further. I mean, maybe it's just sort of a trivial measure of how complicated a knot is, and if it's very complicated, then you can be very sure that it is actually not the R knot. Maybe it's trivial. Maybe there's something deeper why there's a line. I don't know. So I wanted to mention it here. Good. My final topic will be slices and ribbonness, and this is ongoing work with Sergey Gukov, uh, Jim, Chipin, Manulescu. So the slice and problem is similar to the R naught decision problem, but it's a little bit harder. So the question there you ask is, uh, does a knot embed in a CC a bound the smooth or locally flat disk in a four ball, and this will give you the smooth or this topological slice decision problem? So essentially, you take some knot, you fill in the area, and then um, you have this disk, and you're asking properties about this disk. So the reason why mathematicians are interested in this is because it has actually links to very interesting long-standing conjectures. There's the so-called slice ribbon conjecture. And this asks, is every slice knot actually a, a ribbon? So the ribbon knot would be uh, something like this, which only has ribbon intersections or ribbon singularities. Uh, so, so intersections of the band like this. And it's also related to the smooth Poincaré conjecture in four dimensions, which asks, is every four sphere diffeomorphic? So the standard four sphere. So this is why mathematicians are interested in this, because there are these open conjectures that you can actually tackle if you had a good handle on sliceness and ribbonness. So what's true is if a knot is sliced, uh, it's concordant to the R knot. And you can construct this concordance essentially by adding bands until you obtain the R knot. So the game is you start with some knots, you cut it open, you add a band from, from one part to the other. You repeat, you repeat, you repeat until you get the R knot. And if you got the R knot, then the knot was a, was a ribbon knot. So we started setting this up, and we already got, I mean, this is very much work in progress, but we already sort of got new results, found new knots that, that are slice, that have not been known to be sliced before at the 13 and 14 crossings. And um, the way we, we do this is, again, we need to gamify this somehow. So I wanted to explain my last uh, five to 10 minutes. I wanted to explain how we do this, just to give you a concrete example how to set this up. So let's take a nod. Let's take the trefoil here. And the states of uh, the reinforcement learning, oops, the state of the reinforcement learning agent would be somehow this nod encoded. And we chose to encode it by a um, dual graph of the knot. So what you can do is, given the graph, given the knot, you can label the regions here: one, two, three, four, five, or zero, one, two, three, four. And then, if two regions are uh, sort of bounded by, or by, you just take the dual of of the graph of the knot. So sort of two and four would be connected, four and three would be connected, two and zero would be connected. So you get this graph-like object that represents, uh, that is associated with this a graph, with, with this knot. And um, 
we encode it in some sort of adjacency matrix. We're adding some extra information to the adjacency matrix to make sure that we sort of capture whether the, it was going over or under at the different crossings. And so you need to identify them. So we're adding some signs and some numberings to them, but essentially it's the adjacency matrix. So this is one of the things that characterizes the state. And now, as I said, what you have to do is you have to run a band. You have to sort of cut this open somewhere, start a band, end it somewhere, and see whether or not you got the unknot. That's, that's the game. What we do next is we introduce a component matrix sort of which labels which which component which link component you're actually looking at in this case it's just a single knot so everything just has, belongs to the same component here you could have a link sort of a second thing that goes through here and then you would have um, two different components so then you would have ones and twos in here but somehow we're just encoding the different components of the link we're looking at in this case it's just a single knot so it's just ones so this is actually just the adjacency matrix in this case and then we're keeping track of the band by <coughs> seeing which, which phase the, curve, the band is currently in. And we are encoding this in this matrix. And then we're also keeping track of how often you twisted the band. So to make an example of how this works, so let's say in, initially you're, you're somewhere here, so you're at position zero, so the, the agent set or the, the neural network recommended you start, actually start outside somewhere here. Now it recommends you go into phase two. So going from, from the outside into phase two means that initially you attach a band here. So you cut this open and you start the band here. So now you're somewhere in phase two, which is indicated here. Now it recommends you go into phase four. So we're adding, uh, we're going from phase two to phase four and we're going under, under the thing, which is indicated by the minus one here. And then it's recommending to attach as you move into, into phase one. So now we're going into phase one and we attach this. So now we have built a band of the knot. And this was recommended by the neural network that we did this particular thing. So did it help? Well, no, it didn't. This produced an unknot. You can an unlinked component, an unlinked unknot. You can just remove it and you get back the trifle unknot. So it should better try again. But as it turns out, the Trifold is not sliced, so it can run indefinitely, and it will never find a band that actually wins the game. So this game for the agent is not winnable. So what this means is if you actually want to train it to learn something that it can win, it actually needs to see what it needs to do. I mean, if I gave it chess and it could never win, it would not figure out what it actually has to do. It would just sort of always get zero rewards and have no idea what, what the actual point is. So we need ways of generating examples. And we have way, I won't be talking about it, we have ways of generating slice knots, we have different algorithms. For the unknot, we had the same problem, we had algorithms to generate the unknot, to train it on, and so on. So this is an important point. I won't explain how, to do, how we are doing it. If you're interested, you can ask later. But once you have these examples of sort of winnable games, then you just sort of give, you give the neural network essentially this thing, and you ask it, okay, where do I start? It says you start here. I ask, okay, I started here, what do I do next? It tells you, well, you move in there, and so on, and so on, and you just go through it until, um, until you won the game. And again, if, if this actually leads to the unknot at some point, this is a provable result. I can be 100% sure that the knot is slice, just because I can follow the band, I can simplify it, and I can see that I actually got uh, the unknot in the end. So these are the state representations. My actions are, as we just saw it, I ask it where do I start the band, where do I move the band, do I move it over or under, do I twist it, and where do I end it. So this will just be a sequence of, of moves that, where the agent recommends, so now you take the band there, now you do this, now you move it over, now you twist it, and so on. Sometimes it will propose sort of, when I'm zero, it will propose go to four. Well, I can't go from zero to four without crossing something else first. So there are illegal moves, and I'm just masking them out. Um, I'm, so let's say it, it went on. So once it's here, it actually cannot do anything. It cannot go to zero again. You just sort of 
playing a game of self-avoiding walks where you, you cannot visit the same face twice because then you would have to clarify what this band does, but this band is not really part of the knot yet because they haven't attached it yet, so it wouldn't be clear how to spe specify this, so we're not allowing to go backwards into a face that you already visited. So at this point, all it could actually do was attach. Everything else would have been illegal. It might have been that it couldn't even attach there because the point where it is would attach it to a different <coughs> to a different link component. So then it would only have illegal actions, then it would have lost the game. We would tell it it lost, we would reset it. Um, and so on. And also we're sort of forbidding it to run in an endless loop where it just keeps twisting. I mean, one thing that it can always do is once it's here, it cannot attach, but it can twist it, it can twist it, and twist it, and twist it, or it could twist it back and forth and back and forth, which it doesn't do anything. So we're also forbidding that. And we're also setting a maximum number of actions that it can take before we tell it, okay, you ran off into a completely wrong direction, now you reset and you try again. Can you wrap up? Sorry, I'm wrapping up, yes. Um, so th these are the actions, and they're predicted by neural network. And the way we reward it, well, we, we could play a game where we just reward it with the final uh, one, if it solved the not zero if it didn't. Or we could sort of see how much it simplified the not in the end, we want to get the R not, so we could sort of reward it by the number of crossings it had previously versus the number of crossings it has now. And this is, this is one of the examples <coughs> that I took from, uh, from a new node. This is K14N11236. This was, looks like this, and this was not known to be slice, but it's now known to be slice. And this is the band that sort of was attached. You first attach this band, and then you turn it into, into two component link, and then it tells you where to run the next band to twist it and attach it here. And now this thing is the unknown and you have proven that this slice, this does not here slice. And if we look at sort of how successful it is on up to 15 crossing knots, we see that it actually has a success rate of 70 something percent. So that's preliminary, of course, we want to go much further. 14 crossings is not, 15 crossings is not uh, too impressive. We want to go up much higher. But as I said, this is very much work in progress. So let me conclude. We looked at four different things. We looked at data representation and how it might impact the, uh, the conclusions that you draw from it, whether it's being more efficient from a, uh, from a computer science perspective versus being efficient from a math, uh, math perspective. We talked about feature scoring using permutations, using gradients, using layer-wise relevance propagation. We talked about generate, generating counterexamples using embedding layer techniques. And we talked about using reinforcement learning to obtain a provable results that I don't have any any error. Thank you very much. Right, thanks. Uh, so we have lunch waiting for us upstairs. So if there's like this very quick uh, questions, we can take one or two, and of course, there'll be time to discuss. So uh, maybe any other questions. Um, so you could be sample. If you're a lot of randomness, we knew of polynomial time algorithm much earlier. And so I'm wondering, um, are we able to use randomness in machine learning algorithms? So the problem of proving primality, there was no, there was a polynomial time algorithm that I'm allowed to flip points. I sort of proved it was all time. The ability to make random choices along the way allows you to solve the problem more quickly. So I'm wondering if there's any analog that you can find machine can I solve any NP problem by if I allow myself to? Ah, oh, you say no, you can solve no, it no, quicker. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay, good, sorry, I understand. Yeah, yeah, okay. Finality yeah. problem. We knew algorithms long before it, I guess. Yeah. That's a good question. I, yeah, sorry, I have no idea. It's a very good question. I, I can't answer. But you probably would say that these techniques, these intrinsic stochastic, are more along the line. The probability is baked in. You just don't know the answer in this context. Yeah, I don't know whether. Uh, well, yeah. So, uh, I mean, every time you ask in your network what should be the next move, of course, it's not just telling you. It's not just telling you sort of you attach here, but it's so if you attach here is 
70 percent, your touch here is 30 percent, your touch here is 10 percent, and so on. So you always get sort of a probability, and then it's a question of how you sample from the space. It's probabilistic, but they're not guaranteed. So the cons, you yeah. have this. this yeah, but exactly. So that's why I said I cannot answer questions. So Jim pointed out there's stochasticity built in. I don't know whether it helps in this case. About these five new knots, is, is the proof like very complex and like even couldn't come with it, or is it more that you were able to just I mean, try many examples? The, not, the bands that it finds are all simple. They all look kind of like, I mean, this is the proof. You take the knot, you take this band, you know, so the, now you get this blue, this, this, this now are two components, this is one of them, this is the other one. You can simplify it like this. You can actually, I mean, I did this last night. So I, I, I plotted <laughs> this. You, you reduce it to this, and that, so now you have this sum of two trefoils, and then running the band like this, you can directly see that I can pull this down here and this up here, and I get uh, I get two knots. So these two bands actually turn this into a slice knot. Um, so this is this is the proof that this knot is sliced. These, these seven steps. And for the other five nodes, it's not much more complicated. So just confirm there's like a standard notation for these transformations and a like, computer way to check if they're correct, right? Sorry? Is there like, there's a standard notation for these transformations and a decidable procedure to check that they're correct? But if the model outputs something wrong, I assume you just have a I mean, so I can just, I can just do this. I can cut it and... Yeah and attach it here, and now I can just see that I can simplify it to the unknot in the end. So it, it doesn't have to be a standard name. So for the unknot problem, there were like the standard moves that you can do. You can do Markov moves, randomize the moves, and so on. So there are specific stabilizations. There are specific names for these things that you can do, and sort of this, this is what you, what you would then sort of do step after step in order to obtain the final result. In this case, it's really just sort of pictorially routing the band the way the neural network tells you, attaching it, attaching the second one here, and, and then you can just sort of check that. Check that I'm sure there's a formal encoding of this that you could prove it's wrong. That was the question, right? We don't have to rely on the picture. We could oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, you know that sort of, yeah, as I said, sort of, the, the way you play the game is you're not allowed to t attach to a different component. The way you play the game is, of course, the, the, uh, the orientation has to be preserved when you add a band and, and these types of things. It's not a canonical notation. We invented the notation on the, the, the encoding. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. We just made up some, some encoding for this. So I have a question about the step where you sort of constructed this embedding of knots where a bunch of knots with the same properties got end up getting clustered together. So a common thing that you want to do in, in sort of looking for mathematical objects is that you have a bunch of objects with property A and a bunch of objects with, you know, allegedly independent property B, you would like to find something that share, you know, that has property both A and B. Is there a way you can modify this particular step to kind of encourage this uh, kind of example generation? Yes, very good. So what you could do is, um, if you use this type of triplet loss, you could sort of tell it if it, if the, if the thing that you have here, you, you, uh, so you have this triplet of data. You have um, sort of a new point which you're trying to embed. And let's call it A. You have a point where you tell it um, it's similar to this, and you have a point where you tell it it's different from that. So every time it sees a new point, you could just either, if, so if it has property A or B, you could just say, OK, embed it, embed it to something that has either property A or B, and push it away from something that has property C. So just by sort of not distinguishing between having property A or B, you would just have sort of a bunch of stuff mapped together that has property A or B because you were not incentivizing it to push it away. Or in fact, you were incentivizing it to push both A and B onto the same, onto the same um, locus. OK, and, and then I guess as, as you move around the space, you might happen to find an object which then eventually has both properties because like, Exactly. All the things with A and B ended up mapped. Exactly, that would be that would be a hope. So now, ex exactly, now everything that has A or B is mapped there. So it would be natural to hope that something that has A and B lies in, in the vicinity of, of this ball as well. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll have uh, we'll save more questions for the discussion. Let's thank uh, Faith.